everybody. I know it's late. Sorry about sub lateness. That's fine. I mean, I'm sorry. Wait, what? Why is the chat like that? Hold on. Oh, I see that it took... Very weird. Okay, and... Hold on. My settings seem to have gotten kind of messed up. Um... I don't know why the chat is the way that it is. I'm gonna try to fix things. And I see that the video is strange too. Hold on. <clears throat> well gosh, that's annoying. Oh yeah, right, we changed the video um capture thing last time, I think, to cut down on, um, lag. Let's see if it'll work if I, yeah, yeah, I remember that. The, the chat box was in a weird place. Um, thank you about my makeup. I really appreciate that. I'm, like, honestly not great today, but, um, I wanted to- oh, I see we're having dropped frames already. Amazing. Okay. <sighs> Alright, let me change it back to what it was just a second ago. Um, fine, we'll deal with it being smaller. That's just gonna be what it's gonna be. I don't know why it always happens on Sunday. Um, yeah, so, I don't feel great today, but, um, I'm hoping that doing the reading is going to help. So, sorry guys. <clears throat> I do not want to cry and mess up this makeup because it will look awful. Like, even more than I feel like it already looks. Um. So, I'm going to try to jump in. Um. <clears throat> where we last left off was chapter 10, which is in which Calcifer promises Sophie a hint. So. Hal must have come back while Sophie would, and Michael were out. He came out of the bathroom while Sophie was frying breakfast on Calcifer and sat gracefully in the chair, groomed and glowing and smelling of honeysuckle. Dear Sophie, he said, always busy. You were hard at work yesterday, weren't you, in spite of my advice? Why have you made a jigsaw puzzle of my best suit? Just a friendly inquiry, you know? You jellied it the other day, said Sophie. I'm making it over. 
I can do that, said Hal. I thought I showed you. I can also make you a pair of seven-league boots of your own if you give me your size. Something practical and brown calf, perhaps. It's amazing the way one, one can take a step and, um, a step ten and a half miles long and always land in a cow pad. <laughs> it must have been a bull pad, said Sophie. I dare say you found mud from the marshes on them, too. A person my age needs a lot of exercise. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and also find the place where we'll be stopping, because I didn't mark that off beforehand. So, um, hold on, I'm just calculating. You were even busier than I realized then, said Hal, because when I happened to tear my eyes from Letty's lovely, lovely face for an instant yesterday, I could have sworn I saw your long nose poking around the corner of the house. Mrs. Fairfax is a family friend, said Sophie. How was I to know you would be there, too? You have an instinct, Sophie, that's how, said Hal. Nothing is safe from you. If I were to court a girl who lived on an iceberg in the middle of an ocean sooner or later, probably sooner, I'd look up to see you swooping overhead on a broomstick. In fact... By now, I'd be disappointed if you uh, disappointed in you if I didn't see you. Are you off to the iceberg today? Sophie retorted. From the look on Letty's face yesterday, there's nothing that need keep you there. You wrong me, Sophie, Hal said. He sounded deeply injured. Sophie looked suspiciously sideways. Beyond the red jewel swinging in Hal's ear, his profile looked sad and noble. Long years will pass before I leave Letty, he said. And in fact, I'm off to see the king today, a king again today. Satisfied, Mrs. Nose? Sophie was not sure she believed a, a word of this, though it was certainly to Kingsbury with the door knob, um, though it was certainly to Kingsbury with the doorknob read down that Hal departed after breakfast, waving Michael aside when Michael tried to consult him about the perplexing spell. Michael, since he had nothing left to, uh, um, had nothing to do left too, he said he might as well go to uh, Cesare's. Sophie was left alone. She still did not truly believe what Hal had said about Letty, but she had been wrong about him before, and she had only Michael and Calcifer's word for Hal's behavior, after all. She collected up all the little blue triangles of cloth and began guiltily slowing, uh, sewing them back into the silver fishing net, which, had, uh, which was all that was left of the suit. When someone knocked at the door, she started violently, thinking it was the scarecrow again. Poor Davindor, Calcifer said, flickering a purple grin at her. That should be all right, then. Sophie hobbled over and opened it, blew down. There was a cart horse outside. The young fellow of fifty who was, um... The young fellow of fifty who was... <laughs> that makes funny sense, because she's, like, ninety now, so of course she thinks that someone who's, like, fifty is young. Um... There was a cart horse outside. The young fellow of fifty who was leading it wondered if Mrs. Witch had some time which might stop... Had something which might stop it casting shoes all the time. Wait, what? The young fellow of fifty, who was leading it, wondered if Mrs. Witch had something which might stop it casting shoes all the time. Huh. Uh, that must be... I'm wondering if that's like... I don't know what that would be, actually. Let me look it up. Ah, okay, so like, in the general, the cast combines the protection of, so it's like, having to cast its shoes, maybe? Maybe that's what they mean. No, I think they mean like, making shoes for it? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, that's all I could find when I looked up casting horse shoes, but, uh, <clears throat> I'll see, said Sophie, she hobbled over to the grate, what shall I do, she whispered, yellow powder, fourth jar along to the, uh, along on the second shelf, Calcifer whispered back, those spells are mostly belief, don't look uncertain when you give it to him, so Sophie poured yellow powder into a square of paper, as she had seen Michael do, twisted it smartly, and hobbled to the door with it, 
There you are, my boy, she said. That'll stick the shoes on harder than my any hundred nails. Ah, I see, I see. Do you hear me, horse? You won't need a smith for the next year. That'll be a penny, thank you. It was quite a busy day. Sophie had to put down her sewing and sell, with Calcifer's help, a spell to unblock drains, another to fetch goats, and something to make good beer. The only one that gave her any trouble was the customer who pounded on the door in Kingsbury. Sophie opened it red down to find a richly dressed boy, not much older than Michael, white-faced and sweating, wringing his hands on the doorstep. "'Madam Sorceress, for pity's sake,' he said. "'I have to fight a duel tomorrow. Uh, a duel at dawn tomorrow. Give me something to make sure I win. I'll pay any sum, of, uh, sum, uh, any sum you ask.' Sophie looked over her shoulder at Calcifer, and Calcifer made faces back, meaning that there was no such thing ready-made. "'That wouldn't be right at all,' Sophie told the boy severely. "'Besides, dueling is wrong.' Then just give me something that lets me have a fair chance, the lad said des desperately. Sophie looked at him. He was very undersized and clearly in a great state of fear. He had that hopeless look a person who has always, um, who always loses at every, um, a person has, who always loses at everything. I'll see what I can do, Sophie said. She hobbled over to the shelves and scanned the jars. The red one labeled cayenne looked the most likely. Okay. Um, Sophie poured a generous heap of it onto a square of paper. She stood the human skull beside it. "'Because you must know more about this than I do,' she muttered at it. The young man was looking anxiously round the door to watch. Sophie took up a knife and made what she hoped would look like um, mystic passes over the heap of pepper. "'You are to make it a fair fight,' she mumbled. "'A fair fight. Understand?' She screwed the paper up and hobbled over to the door with it. "'Throw this in the air when the duel starts,' she told the undersized young man, "'and it will give you the same chance as the older man. "'As the other man. "'After that, whether you win or not depends on you.' "'The undersized young man was so grateful that he tried to give her a gold piece. "'Sophie refused to take it, so he gave her a two-penny bit instead "'and went away whistling happily. "'I feel a fraud,' Sophie said as she stowed the bunny under the, under the hearthstone. "'But I would like to be there at that fight.' <laughs> "'So would I,' crackled H H Calcifer." When are you going to release me so that I can go and see things like that? When I've got a uh, when I've got even a hint about this contract, Sophie said. You may get one later today, said Calcifer. Michael breezed in toward the end of the um, the end of the afternoon. He took an anxious look around to make sure Hal had not come home first, and went to the bench where he got things out to make it look as if he'd been busy singing cheerfully while he did. I envy you being able to walk all that way so easily, Sophie said, sewing a blue triangle to a silver braid. How was my- <clears throat> My niece. Michael gladly left the workbench and sat on the stool by the hearth to tell her all about his day. Then he asked about Sophie's. The result was that when Hal shouldered the door open with his arms full of parcels, Markle, uh, Michael was not even looking busy. He was rolling around on the stool laughing at the dual spell. Uh, uh, laughing at the dual spell. Hal backed into the door to shut it and leaned there in a tragic attitude. Look at you all, he said. Ruin stares me in the face. I slave all day for you all. And not even one of you, and not one of you, even Calcifer, can spare time to say hello. Michael sprang up guiltily, and Calcifer said, I never do say hello. <laughs> is something wrong? asked Sophie. Uh, is something wrong? asked Sophie. That's better, said Hal. Some of you are pretending to notice me at least. How kind of you to ask, Sophie. Yes, something is wrong. The king has asked me officially to find his brother for him, with a strong hint that destroyed the witch of the waste would come uh, that destroying the witch of the waste would come in handy too, and you all sit there and laugh. By now it was clear that Hal was in a mood to produce green slime any second. Sophie hurriedly put it, uh, put her sewing away. I'll make some hot buttered toast, she said. Is that all you can do in the face of tragedy? Hal said. Make toast No, don't get up. I've trudged here laden with stuff for you, so the least you can do is show polite interest. Here. He tipped a shower of parcels into Sophie's lap and handed another to Michael. Mystified, Sophie unwraps, uh, unwrapped things. Several pairs of silk stockings, two parcels of the finest <clears throat> cambric petticoat, um, of the finest cambric petticoats, with flounces, lace, and satin insets. A pair of elastic-sided boots in dove-gray suede, a lace shawl, and a dress of gray watered silk trimmed with lace that matched the shawl. Sophie look, uh, took one professional look at each and gasped. The lace alone was worth a fortune. She stroked the silk of the dress, awed. Michael unwrapped a handsome new uh, velvet suit. "'You must have spent every bit that was in the silk purse,' he said ungratefully. "'I don't need this. You're the one who needs a new suit.' 
Hell hooked his boot into what, um, into what remained of the blue and silver suit and held it up ruefully. Sophie had been working hard, but it was still more whole than suit. How selfless, am I, uh, how selfless I am, he said. But I can't send you and Sophie to blacken my name to the king in rags. The king would think I didn't look after my old mother properly. Well, Sophie, are the boots the right size? Sophie looked up from her odd stroking. Are you being kind, she said, or cowardly? Thank you very much, and no, I won't. What an ingratitude, Hal exclaimed, spreading out both arms. Let's have green slime again, after which I shall be forced to move the castle a thousand miles away and never see my lovely Letty again. Michael looked at Sophie imploringly. Sophie glowered. She saw well enough that the happiness of both her sisters depended on her agreeing to, the king, uh, to see the king, with green slime in reserve. You haven't asked me to do anything yet, she said. You've just said I'm going to. Hal smiled, and you are going to, aren't you? All right. What do you want, uh, when do you want me to go, Sophie said. Tomorrow afternoon, said Hal. Michael can go as your footman. The king's expecting you. He sat on the stool and began explaining very clearly and soberly just what Sophie was to say. There was no trace of the green slime mood now that things were going Hal's way, Sophie noticed. She wanted to slap him. I want you to do a very delicate job, Hal explained, so that the king will go on giving me work like the transport spells, but not trust me with anything like finding his brother. You must tell him how I've angered the Witch of the Waste and explain what a good son I am to you, but I want you to do it in such a way that he'll understand I'm really quite useless. Hal explained in great deal. Sophie clasped her hands round the parcels and tried to take it all in, though she could not help thinking, if I was the king, I wouldn't understand a word of what the old woman was driving at. Michael, meanwhile, was hovering at um, Hal's elbow, trying to ask him about the perplexing spell. Hal kept, <clears throat> Hal kept thinking of new, delicate uh, details to tell the king, and waving Michael away. Not now, Michael. And it occurred to me, Sophie, that you might want some practice in order not to find the palace overwhelming. We don't want you coming over clear in the middle of the interview. Not yet, Michael. So I arranged for you to pay a call to my old tutor, Mrs. Penstemon. She's a gra uh, grand old thing. In some ways, she's grander than the king. So you'll be quite used to that kind of thing by the time you get to the palace. By this time, Sophie was wishing she had never agreed. She was heartily relieved when Hal at, le um, at last turned to Michael. Right, Michael, your turn now. What is it? Michael waved the shiny gray paper and explained in an unhappy rush how impossible the spell seemed to do. Hal seemed faintly astonished to hear this, but he took the paper, saying, Now where was your problem? and spread it out. He stared at it. One of his eyebrows shut up, uh, shot up. I tried it as a puzzle, and I tried doing it just as it says, Michael explained, but Sophie and I couldn't catch the falling star. Great gods above, he ex Hal exclaimed. He started to laugh and bit his lip to stop himself. But Michael, this isn't the spell I left you. Where did you find it? On the bench in that heap of things Sophie piled around the skull, said Michael. It was the only new spell there, so I thought... Hal leaped up and sort, uh, sorted among the things on the bench. Sophie strikes again, he said. Things skidded right and left as he searched. I might have known. No proper, uh, no, the proper spell, not, um, the proper spell's not here. He tapped the skull thoughtfully on its brown, shiny dome. You're doing, friend? I have a notion you come from there. Uh, you come from there. I'm sure the guitar does. Er, Sophie, dear. What? said Sophie. Busy old fool and really Sophie, said Hal. Am I right in thinking that you turned my doorknob black side down and stuck your long nose out through it? Just my finger, Sophie said with dignity. But you opened the door, said Hal, and the thing Michael thinks is a spell must have got through. Didn't it occur to either of you that it doesn't look like spells usually do? Spells often look peculiar, Michael said. What is it really? Hal gave a snort, uh, a snort of laughter. Decide what, it, uh, what this is about. Write a second verse. Oh, Lord, he said, and ran for the stairs. I'll show you, he called as he, his feet pounded, uh, pounded up them. <clears throat> I think we wasted our time rushing around the marshes last night, Sophie said. <clears throat> Michael nodded gloomily. Sophie could see that he was feeling a fool. It was my fault, she said. I opened the door. What was outside? Michael asked with great interest. But Hal came charging back downstairs just then. I haven't got that book after all, he said. He seemed upset now. Michael, did I hear you say you went out and tried to catch a shooting star? Yes, but it was scared stiff and fell into a pool and drowned, Michael said. Thank goodness for that, said Hal. It was very sad, Sophie said. 
Sad, was it? said Hal, more upset than ever. It was your idea, was it? It was your idea, was it? It would be. I can just see you hopping about the marshes, encouraging him. Let me tell you, that was the most stupid thing he's ever done in his life. He'd have been more than sad if he'd a uh, chance to catch that thing. And you... Calcifer flickered sleepily up in the chimney. "'What's all this fuss about?' he demanded. "'You caught one yourself, didn't you?' "'Yes, and I—' Hal began, turning his glass marble glare on Calcifer. But he pulled himself together and turned on to Michael instead. "'Michael, promise me you'll never try to catch one again.' "'I promise,' Michael said willingly. "'What is that writing if it's not a spell?' Hal looked at the gray paper in his hand. "'It's called Song, and that's what it is, I suppose. "'But it's not all here, and I can't remember the rest of it.' He stood and thought, as if a new idea had struck him, one which obviously worried him. "'I think the next verse was important,' he said. i better take it back and see.' He went to the door and turned the knob black down. Then he paused. He looked round at Michael and Sophie, who were naturally enough both staring at the knob. "'All right,' he said. "'I know Sophie will squirm through somehow if I leave her behind, and that's not fair to Michael.' "'Come along, both of you, so I've got you where I can keep my eye on you.' He opened the door on the nothingness and walked into it. Michael fell over the stool in, a rush to, in his rush to follow. Sophie shed parcels right and left into the hearth as she sprang up too. "'Don't let any sparks get on those,' she said hurriedly to Calcifer. "'If you promise to tell me what's out there,' Calcifer said. "'You had your hint, by the way.' "'Did I?' said Sophie. She was in too much of a hurry to attend. Um, <clears throat> I think it was that maybe he's a shooting star. Calcifer? I wonder. <laughs> um, let me take some water. Hold on. Okay, chapter 11, in which Hal goes to a strange country in search of a spell. The nothingness was only inch thick, after all. Beyond that, um, in, uh, no, beyond it, in a gray, drizzling evening, was a cement path down to a garden gate. Hal and Michael were waiting at the gate. Beyond that was a flat, hard-looking road lined with houses on both sides. Sophie looked back at where she had come from, shivering rather than in the drizzle, uh, shivering, shivering rather in the drizzle, and found the castle had become a, a house of yellow brick and large windows. Like all the other houses, it was square and new, with a front door of wobbly glass. Nobody seemed to be about. Uh, nobody seemed to be about among the houses. That may have um, may have been due to the drizzle, but Sophie had a feeling that it was really because, in spite of there being so many houses. This was somewhere at the edge of a town. When you've quite finished nosing, Hal called. His gray and scarlet finery was all misted with drizzle. He was dangling a bunch of strange keys, most of which were flat and yellow and seemed to match the houses. When Sophie came down the path, he said, We need to be dressed in keeping with this place. His finery uh, blurred, as if the drizzle round him had suddenly become a fog. When it came into focus again, it was still scar scarlet and gray, but quite a different shape. The dangling sleeves had gone, and the whole outfit was baggier. It looked worn and shabby. Mike Michael's jacket had become a waist-length padded thing. He lifted his foot, with a canvas, a canvas shoe on it, and stared at the tight blue things encasing his legs. "'I can hardly bend my knee,' he said. "'You'll get used to it,' said Hal. "'Come on, Sophie.' To Sophie's surprise, Hal led the way back up the garden path toward the yellow house. The back of his baggy jacket, she saw, had mysterious words on it, Welsh Rugby. Michael followed Hal, walking in on a um, walking in a kind of tight strut because of the things on his legs. Sophie looked down at herself and saw twice as much skinny legs showing above her knobbly shoe, uh, knobbly shoes. Otherwise, not much about her had changed. Hal unlocked the wavy glass door with one of his keys. It had a wooden notice hanging beside it on chains, Rivendell. Sophie read, as Hal pushed her into a neat, shiny hall space. There seemed to be people in the house. Loud voices were coming from behind the nearest door. When Hal opened that door, Sophie realized that the voices were coming from magic-colored picture, uh, pictures moving on the front of a big square box. Hal! 
exclaimed a woman who was sitting there knitting. She put down her knitting, looked a little annoyed, but before she could get up, a small girl who had been watching the ma magic picture very seriously with her chin in her hands leaped up and flung herself at Hal. Uncle Hal! She screamed and jumped halfway up Hal with her legs wrapped around him. Oh, it's like a modern day thing. This house seems to be in like modern day or something. Mari! Hal bawled in reply. How are you, Cariad? Been a good girl, then? He and the little girl broke into a foreign language then, fast and loud. Sophie could see that they were very special to one another. She wondered about the language. It sounded the same as so I, the magic box is actually a TV. Um, I imagine. And, yeah, like I said, he's wearing, like, a rugby uniform. It's only strange to Sophie, because she hasn't seen that kind of stuff. But, obviously, we would have... But since Sophie's our narrator, that's the kind of view we're getting from this. Yeah. Um. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. She wondered about the language. It sounded the same as Calcifer's silly saucepan song, but it was hard to be sure. In between bursts of foreign chatter, Hal managed to say, as if he were a ventriloquist, This is my niece, Mari, and my sister, Megan Perry. Megan, this is Michael Fisher, and Sophie, er, Hatter, said Sophie. Megan shook hands with both of them in a restrained, disapproving way. She was older than Hal, but quite like him, with the same long, angular face, but her eyes were blue and full of anxieties. I can't imagine what that's like. And her hair was darkish. Quiet now, Mari, she said in a voice that cut through the foreign chatter. Howell, are you staying long? And it's, by the way, just to let you know, Howell, or the way Howell, how she's saying it is actually Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L. As opposed to what we know him as, H O W L. How well are you staying long? Just dropped in for a moment, Hal said, lowering Mari to the floor. Gareth isn't in yet, Megan said in a meaning sort of way. What a pity! We can't stay, Hal said, smiling in a warm, false smile. I just thought I'd introduce you to my friends here, and I want to ask you something that may sound silly. Has Neil, by any chance, lost a piece of English home uh, English homework lately? "'Funny you should say that!' Megan exclaimed. "'Looking everywhere for it, he was, last Thursday. "'He's got this new English teacher, see, and she's very strict. "'Doesn't just worry about spelling, either. "'Puts the fear of God into them about getting work in on time. "'Doesn't do Neil any harm, lazy little devil. "'So here he is on Thursday, hunting high and low, "'and all he can find is a funny old piece of writing.' "'Ah!' said Hal. "'What did he do with that writing?' "'I told him to hand it in to, the, uh, to this Miss Angorian of his,' Megan said." Might show her he tried for once. And did he? Hal asked. I don't know. Better ask Neil. He's up in the front bedroom with that machine of his, said Mal. Oh, said uh, Megan. But you won't get a word of sense of, out of him. Come on, Hal said to Michael and Sophie, who were both staring round the uh, shiny brown and orange room. He took Mari's hand and led them all out of the um, out of the room and up the stairs. Even those had a carpet, a pink and green one. So the procession led by Hal hardly made any noise as it went along the pink and green passage upstairs and into a room with blue and yellow carpet. But Sophie was not sure the two boys crouched over the various um, magic boxes on a big table by the window would have looked up for, uh, for an army with a brass band. Uh, for even an uh, would have looked up even for an army with a brass band. The main magic box had a glass front like the one downstairs, but it seemed to be showing writing and diagrams more than pictures. All the boxes grew on long, floppy, white stalks that appeared to be rooted to the wall, um, rooted in the wall at one side of the room. Neil, said Hal. Don't interrupt, one of the boys said. He'll lose his life. Ah, they're playing video games. Seeing it was a matter of life and death, Sophie and Michael backed toward the door, but Hal, quite an unperturbed at killing his nephew, strode over at the wall and pulled the boxes up by the roots. The picture on the box va- oh my god, he just unplugged it. The picture on the box vanished. Both boys knew, um, both boys said words which Sophie did not think even Martha knew. The second boy spun round shouting, Mari, I'll get you for that. Was it me this time? So, Mari uh, shouted back. Neil whirled further round and stared accusingly at Hal. How do, Neil? Hal said pleasantly. Who is he? The other boy asked. My no good uncle, Neil said. He glowered at Hal. He was, at, he was dark, with thick eyebrows, and his glower was impressive. What do you want? Put that plug back in. There's a welcome in the valleys, said Hal. I'll put it back when I've asked you something and you've answered, Neil sighed. 
Uncle Howell, I'm in the middle of a computer game. A new one? Asked Hal. Both the boys looked disconcerned, uh, discontented. No, it's one I had for Christmas, Neil said. You ought to know the way that they go on about wasting time and money on useless things. They won't give me another till my birthday. Then that's easy, said Hal. You won't mind stopping if you've done it before, and I'll bribe you with a new one. Really? Both boys said eagerly, and Neil added, Can you make it another one of those that nobody else has got? Yes. But just take a look at this first and tell me what it is. Hal said, and he held um, and he held the shiny gray paper out in front of Neil. Both boys looked at it. Neil said, "It's a poem," in the way most people would say, "It's a dead rat." It's the one Miss Angorian um, set for last week's homework," said the other boy. "I remember wind and find. It's about sub uh, submarines." While Sophie and Michael blinked at this new theory, wondering how they had missed it, Neil exclaimed, "Hey, it's my long lost homework! Where did you find it?" Was that funny writing that turned up yours? Miss Angorian said it was interesting, lucky for me, and she took it home with her. Thank you, said Hal. Where does she live? The flat over Mrs. Phillips' tea shop, Cardiff Road, said Neil. When will you give me the new tape? When you remember how the rest of the poem goes, said Hal. That's not fair, said Neil. I can't even remember that the bit that was written down now. That's just playing with a person's feelings. He stopped when Hal laughed, felt in one baggy pocket, and handed him a flat packet. Thanks, Neil, sa uh, Neil said devoutly. And without any more ado, he whirled round um, toward the to the, he whirled round to his magic boxes. Hal planted the bundle of roots back in the wall, grinning, the plug, and beckoned Michael and Sophie out of the room. Both boys began a flurry of mysterious activity into which Mari somehow squeezed herself, watching with her thumb in her mouth. Hal hurried away to the pink and green stairs, but Michael and Sophie both hung about near the door of the room, wondering what the whole thing about was about. Inside, Neil was reading aloud, You are in an enchanted castle with four do doors. Each opens on a different dimension. In dimension one, the castle is moving constantly and may a arrive at a hazard at any time. Sophie wondered at the familiarity of this as she hobbled down the stairs to the stairs. She found Michael standing halfway down, looking embarrassed. Hal was at the foot of the stairs, having an argument with his sister. "'What do you mean you've sold all my books?' She, uh, "'What do you mean you've sold all my books?' she heard Hal saying. "'I needed one of them particularly. They weren't yours to sell.' "'Don't keep interrupting,' Megan answered in a low, ferocious voice. "'Listen now. I've told you before, I'm not a storehouse for your property. "'You're a disgrace to me and Gareth, lounging about in those clothes "'instead of buying a proper suit and looking respectable for once, "'taking up with riffraff and layabouts, bringing them to this house?' Are you trying to bring me down to your level? You had all that education, you didn't. Uh, you don't even get a decent job. You just hang around, wasting all that time at college, wasting all those sacrifices other people made, wasting your money. Megan would have been a match for Mrs. Fairfax. Her voice went on and on. Sophie began to understand how Hal had acquired the habit of slithering out. Megan was the kind of person who made you want to back quietly out of the nearest door. Unfortunately, Hal was backed up against the stairs, and Sophie and Michael were bottled up behind him. Never doing an honest day's work, never getting a job I could be proud of, bringing shame on me and Gareth, coming here and spoiling Mari rotten, making ground on remorselessly. Sophie pushed Michael aside and stumped, over, uh, stumped downstairs, looking as stately as she could manage. Come, Hal, she said grandly. We really must be on our way. While we stand here, money is ch uh, ticking away, and your servants are probably selling the gold plate. "'So nice to meet you,' she said to Megan as she arrived at the foot of the stairs. "'But we must rush. Hal is such a busy man.' Megan gulped a bit and stared at Sophie. Sophie gave her a stately nod and pushed Hal toward the wavy glass front door. Michael's face was bright red. Sophie saw that because Hal turned back to ask Megan, "'Is my old car still in the shed, or have you sold that, too?' "'You've got the only set of keys,' my Megan answered dourly. "'That seemed to be the, on uh, the only goodbye.' The front door slammed, and Hal took them to a square white building at the end of the flat, back, uh, flat black road. Hal did not say anything about Megan. He said, as he unlocked a wide door in the building, I suppose the fierce English teacher is bound to have a copy of that book. Sophie wished to forget the next bit. They rode in a carriage without horses and went at a terrifying speed, smelling and growling and shaking as it tore down some of the steepest roads Sophie had ever seen, rode so steep that she wondered why the houses lining them did not slide into a heap at the bottom. She shut her eyes and clung to some of the pieces that had torn off the seats and simply hoped it would be over soon. Luckily it was. 
They arrived in a flatter road, with houses crammed in on uh, both sides, besides a large window filled with a white curtain and a notice that said, Tea's closed. Uh, but beside that, um, uh, but despite this foreboding notice, um, sorry, but despite this forbidding notice, uh, when Hal pressed a button on a, to, at a small door beside the window, Miss Angorian opened the door. They all stared at her. For a fierce school teacher, Miss Angorian was astonishing, astonishing, blah, astonishingly young and slender and good-looking. She had sheets of blue-black hair hanging round her olive-brown, heart-shaped face and enormous dark eyes. The only thing which suggested fear, fierceness about her was the direct and clever way those enormous eyes looked and seemed to sum them up. I'll take a small guess that you may be Hal Jenkins, uh, Mrs. Angor Miss Angorian said to Hal. She had a low, melodious voice that was nevertheless rather amused and quite sure of itself. Hal was taken aback for, a mo uh, for an instant. Then his smile snapped on. And that, Sophie thought, was goodbye to the pleasant dreams of Letty and Mrs. Fairfax. For Miss Angorian was exactly the kind of lady someone like Hal could be trusted to fall in love with on the spot. And not only how, Michael was staring admiringly too, and though all the houses around were apparently deserted, Sophie had no doubt that they were full of people who all b knew both Hal and Miss Angorian were w uh, and were watching with interest to see what would happen. She could feel their invisible eyes. Arkit Chipping was like that too. And you must be Miss Angorian, said Hal. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm uh, I made bleh, but I made a stupid mistake last week and carried off my nephew's English homework instead of a rather important paper I had with me. I gather Neil gave it to you as proof that he wasn't shirking. He did, said Miss, uh, said Miss Angorian. You'd better come in and collect it. Sophie was sure the invisible eyes in all of the houses goggled and the invisible necks craned as Hal and Michael and she trop, uh, trooped in through Miss Angorian's door and up a flight of stairs to Miss Angorian's tiny, severe, uh, severe living room. Miss Angorian said considerately to Sophie, Won't you sit down? Sophie was still shaking from the horseless carriage. She sat down gladly on one of the two chairs. It was not very comfortable. Miss Angorian's room was not designed for comfort, but for study. Though many of the things in it were strange, Sophie understood the walls of books and the pe uh, piles of paper on the table, and the folders stacked on the floor. She sat and watched Michael staring sheepishly, and Hal turning on his charm. Um... How is it, um, how is it you come to know who I am? Hal said beguilingly. You seem to have caused a lot of gossip in, ta in this town, Miss Angorian said, busy sorting through papers on the table. And what have those people who gossip told you? Hal asked. He leaned languishly on the, um, on the end of the, blah. he leaned languishly on the end of the table and tried to catch Miss Angorian's eye. That you disappear and turn up rather unpredictably for one thing, Miss Angorian said. <laughs> and what else? Hal followed Miss Angorian's movements with such a look that Ho Sophie knew Letty's only chance was for Miss Angorian to fall instantly in love with Hal, too. But Miss Angorian was not that kind of lady. She said, Many other things, few of them to your credit, and caused Michael to blush by looking at him, and, when, and then at Sophie in a way that suggested these things were not fit for their ears. She held a yellowish, wavy-edged paper out to Hal. Here it is, she said severely. Do you know what it is? "'Of course,' said Hal. "'Then please tell me,' said Miss Angorian. Hal took the paper. There was a bit of a scuffle as he tried to take Miss Angorian's hand with it. Miss Angorian won the scuffle and put her hands behind her back. Hal smiled meltingly and passed the paper to Michael. "'You tell her,' he said. Michael's blushing face lit up as soon as he looked at it. "'It's the spell! Oh, I can do this one. It's enlargement, isn't it?' "'That's what I thought,' Miss Angorian said rather accusingly. "'I'd like to know what you were doing with such a thing.' "'Miss Angorian,' said Hal, "'if you have heard all those things about me, "'you must know I wrote my, doc uh, my doctoral the thesis on charms and spells. "'You look as if you suspect me of working black magic. "'I assure you, I never worked any kind of spell in my life.' "'Sophie could not stop herself making a small snort at this blatant lie. "'With my hand on my heart,' Hal added, giving Sophie an irritated frown, "'this spell is for study purposes only. "'It's very old and rare. "'That's why I wanted it back.' "'Well, you have it back,' Miss Angorian said briskly. "'Before you go, would you mind giving me my homework sheet in return? "'Photocopies cost money.' "'Hal thought, uh, brought out the gray paper willingly and held it just out of reach. "'This poem now,' he said, "'it's been bothering me. "'Silly, really, but I can't remember the rest of it. "'By Walter Raleigh, isn't it?' "'Miss Angorian gave him a withering look. "'Certainly not. "'It's by John Dunn, 
and it's very well known indeed. I have the book with it in here, if you want uh, to refresh your memory. Please, said Hal, and from the way his eyes followed Miss Angorian as she went to her wall of books, Sophie realized that this was the real reason why Hal had come into this, str uh, into this strange land where his family lived. But Hal was not above killing two birds with one stone. Miss Angorian, he said pleadingly, following her contours as she stretched for the book, would you consider coming out for some supper with me tonight? This is really weird. You're gonna ask her out while you're with these other people? Wait. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Like, most of this book is not in the movie. Um, again, I feel like they did really well with a lot of the imagery. A lot of the imagery, not all of it. Um, but most of the storyline stuff is not actually in the movie. Miss Angorian turned round with a large book in her hands, looking more severe than ever. I would not, she said. Mr. Jenkins, I don't know what you've heard about me, but you must have heard that I still consider myself engaged to Ben Sullivan. Never heard of him, said Hal. My fiancé, said Miss Angorian. He disappeared some years back. Now, do you wish me to read this poem out to you? Do that, Hal said, quite repent unrepentant. You have such a lovely voice. Then I'll start with the second verse, Miss Angorian said, since you have the first verse there in your hand. She read, very, uh, she read very well, not only melodiously, but in a way which made the second verse fit the rhythm of the first, which, in Sophie's opinion, it did not do at all. If thou best born to strange sights, things invisible to see, ride ten thousand days and nights till age snow-white hairs on thee. Thou, when thou returnest, wilt tell me all strange wonders that befelt thee, and swear, nowhere, lives a woman true and fair. If thou... Hell had gone a terrible white. Sophie could see sweat standing on his face. Thank you, he said. Stop there. I won't trouble you for the rest. Even the good woman is untrue in the last verse, isn't she? I remember now. Silly of me. Chunt on, of course. Miss Angorian lowered the book and stared at him. He forced up a smile. We must be going now. Sure you won't change your mind about supper? I will not, said Miss Angorian. Are you quite well, Mr. Jenkins? In the pink, said Hal said. And he hustled Michael and Sophie away down the stairs and into the horrible, horseless carriage. The invisible watchers in the houses must have thought Miss Angorian was chasing them with a saber if they judged from the speed with which Hal packed them into, uh, packed them into it and drove off. What's the matter? Michael asked as the carriage went roaring and grinding uphill again and Sophie clung to bits of the seat for dear life. Hal pretended not to hear, so Michael waited until Hal was locking it into the sh its shed and asked again. Oh, nothing, Hal said airily, leading the way back to the yellow house called Rivendale. The Witch of the Waste has caught up with me with her curse, that's all. Bound to happen sooner or later. He seemed to be calculating or doing sums in his head while he opened the garden gate. Ten thousand, Sophie heard him murmur. That brings it to mi about Midsummer Day. What is brought to Midsummer Day? asked Sophie. The time I'll be ten thousand days old, Hal said. And that, Mrs. Knows, he said, swinging into the garden of Rivendale, is the day I shall have to go back to the Witch of the Waste. Sophie and Michael hung back on the path, staring at Hal's back, so mysteriously labeled Welsh Rugby. If I keep clear of mermaids, they, hear, they heard him mutter, and don't touch a mandrake root. Michael called out, do we have to go back into that house? And Sophie called, what will the witch do? I shudder to think, Hal said. You don't have to go back in, Michael. He opened the wavy glass door. Inside was the familiar room of the castle. Calcifer's sleepy flames were colored, uh, coloring the walls faintly blue-green in the dusk. Hal flung back his long sleeves and gave Calcifer a log. <laughs> she caught up, old blue face. Uh, she caught up, old blue face. I know, said Calcifer. I felt it take. Chapter 12 In which Sophie becomes Hal's old mother. No, I don't think he was asking her out for that. I think he just likes her. Um, I think he was just enchanted. Um, Sophie did not see much point in blackening Hal's name to the king, now that the witch had caught up with him. But Hal said it was more important than ever. I shall need everything I've got just to escape the uh, just to escape the witch, he said. I can't have the king after me as well. So the following afternoon, Sophie put on her new clothes and sat feeling very fine, if rather stiff, waiting for Michael to get ready and for Hal to finish in the bathroom. <clears throat> While she waited, she told Calcifer about the strange country where Hal's family lived. 
It took her mind off the king. Calcifer was very interested. I knew he came from foreign parts, he said, but this sounds like another world. Clever of the witch to send the curse in from there. Very clever all around. That's magic I admire, using something that exists anyway and turning it round into a curse. I did wonder about it when you and Michael were reading it the other day. That fool Hal told her too much about himself. Sophie gazed at uh, Calcifer's thin blue face. It did not surprise her to find Calcifer admired the curse, any more than it surprised her when he called Hal a fool. He was always insulting Hal. But she never could work out if ha Calcifer really hated Hal. Calcifer looked so evil anyway that it was hard to tell. Calcifer moved his orange eyes to look into Sophie's. I'm scared too, he said. I shall suffer with Hal if the witch catches him. If you don't break the contract before she does, I won't be able to help you at all. Before Sophie could ask more, Hal came dashing out of the bathroom, looking his very finest, scenting the room with roses and yelling for Michael. Michael clattered downstairs in his blue, new uh, blue velvet. <laughs> Sophie stood up and collected her trusty stick. It was time to go. "'You look wonderfully rich and stately,' Michael said to her. "'She does me credit,' said Hal, apart from that awful old stick. "'Some people,' said Sophie, "'are, thoughtful, are thoroughly self-centered. Self "'This stick goes with me.' I need it for moral support. Hal looked at the ceiling, but did not argue. They took their stately way into the streets of Kingsbury. Sophie, of course, looked back to see what the castle was like here. She saw a big, arched gateway surrounding a small black door. The rest of the castle seemed to be a blank stretch of plastered wall between two caved stoned house uh, stone houses. Before you ask, said Hal, it re it's really just a disused stable. This way. They walked through the streets, looking at least as uh, at least as fine as any of the passerby. Not that many people were about. Kingsbury was a long way south, and it was a bakingly hot day there. The pavements shimmered. Sophie discovered another disadvantage of being old. You felt queer in hot weather. The elaborate buildings wavered in front of her eyes. She was annoyed because she wanted to look at the pla she wanted to look at the place, but all she had was a dim impression of golden domes and tall houses. By the way, Hal said. Mrs. Penstemon will call you Miss Mrs. Pendragon. Pendragon's the name I go under here. Whatever for, said Hal. For disguise, uh, said Sophie, rather. For disguise, said Hal. Pendragon's a lovely name, much better than Jenkins. I get by quite well with a plain name, Sophie said as they turned into a blessedly narrow, cool street. We can't all be mad hatters, said Hal. Mrs. Penstemon's house was a gracious and tall near the end, uh, was gracious and tall near the end of the narrow street. It had orange trees and tubs on either side of its handsome front door. This door was opened by an elderly footman in black velvet, who led them into a wonderfully cool black-and-white checkered marble hall, where Michael tried to uh, tried secretly to wipe sweat off his face. Hal, who always seemed to be cool, treated the footman as an old friend and made jokes to him. The footman passed them on uh, onto a page boy in red and bleh. the footman passed them onto a page boy in red velvet. Sophie, as the boy led them unceremoniously up polished stairs, began to see why this made good practice for meeting the king. She felt as if she were in a palace already. When the boy ushered them into a shaded drawing room, she was sure even a palace could not be this elegant. Everything in the room was blue and gold and white and small and fine. Mrs. Penstemon was finest of all. She was tall and thin, and she sat bolt upright in a blue and gold embroidered chair, supporting herself rigidly with one hand, in a gold mesh mitten. Uh, with one hand and a gold mesh mitten. Um, th that sounds like I'm reading it wrong, but it's not. Gold mesh mitten. Uh, <laughs> on a gold-topped cane. She wore old gold silk and a very stiff and old-fashioned style, finished off with an old gold headdress, not unlike a crown, which tied in a large old gold, old gold bow beneath her gaunt eagle face. She was the finest and most frightening lady Sophie had ever seen. "'Ah, my dear Hal,' she said, holding out a gold mesh mitten. Hal bent and kissed the mitten, as he was obviously supposed to. He did it very gracefully, but it was rather spoiled from back view by Hal flapping his other hand furiously at Michael behind his back. Michael, a little too slowly, realized he was supposed to stand by the door beside the page boy. He backed there in a hurry, only too pleased to get as far away from Mrs. Pensemon as he could. Pensemon as he could. "'Mrs. Penstemon, allow me to present my old mother,' Hal said, waving his hand at Sophie. Since Sophie felt just like Michael, Hal had to flip his, uh, flap his hand at her, too. "'Charmed, delighted,' said Mrs. Penstemon, and she held her gold mitten out to Sophie. Sophie was not sure if Mrs. Penstemon meant for her to kiss the mitten as well, but she could not bring herself to try. 
She laid her own hand on the mitten instead. The hand under it felt like a, an old, cold claw. After feeling it, Sophie was quite surprised that Mrs. Pentstemon was alive. Forgive me, my mon uh, forgive my not standing up, P Mrs. Pendragon, Mrs. Pentstemon said. My health is not good. It forced me to retire from teaching three years ago. Pray sit down, both of you. Trying not to shake with nerves, Sophie sat grandly in the embroidered chair opposite Mrs. Pentstemon's, supporting herself on her stick in what she hoped was the same elegant way. Hal spread himself gracefully in a chair next to her. He looked quite at home, and Sophie envied him. I am eighty-six, Mrs. Pentstemon announced. How old are you, my dear, uh, my near, bleh. how are you, my dear Mrs. Pendragon? Ninety, Sophie said, that being the first high number that came to her head, uh, came into her head. So old, Mrs. Pentstemon said, with my, might have been slight stately envy. How lucky you are to move so nimbly still. Oh, yes, she's so wonderfully nimble, Hal agreed, that sometimes there's no stopping her. Mrs. Pinstemon gave him a look which told Sophie that she had been a teacher at least as fierce as Miss Angorian. I am talking to your mother, she said. I dare say she is as proud of you as I am. We are two old ladies who both had a hand in forming you. You are, one might say, our joint creation. Don't you think I did any of, it, uh, any of me myself, then? Hal asked. Put in just a few touches of my own? A few, and those not altogether to my liking, Miss Pen Mrs. Penstemon said. But you will not wish to sit here and hear yourself being discussed. You will go down and sit on the terrace, taking your page boy with you, where Hunch will bring you both a cool drink. Go along. If Sophie had not been so nervous herself, she might have laughed at the expression on Hal's face. He had obviously not expected this to happen at all. But he got up, with only a slight shrug, made a slight warning face at Sophie, and shooed Michael out of the room ahead of him. Mrs. Penstemon turned her rigid body very slightly to watch them go. Then she nodded at the page boy, who scuttled out of the room, too. After that, Mrs. Penstemon turned ba herself back towards Sophie, and Sophie felt more nervous than ever. I prefer him with black hair, Mrs. Penstemon announced. That boy is going to be, uh, uh, that boy is going to the bad. Who? Michael? Sophie said, bewildered. Not the servitor, said Mrs. Penstemon. I do not think he is clever enough to cause me concern. I am talking about how, Mrs. Pendragon. Oh, said Sophie, wondering why Mrs. Penstemon only said going. Hal had certainly arrived at the bad long ago. Take his whole appearance, Mrs. Penstemon said sweepingly. Look at his clothes. He is always very careful about his appearance, Sophie agreed, and wondered why she was putting it so mildly. And always was. I am careful about my appearance, too, and I see no harm in that, said Mrs. Penstemon. But what call has he to be walking around in a charmed suit? It is a dazzling attraction charm, directed at ladies, very well done, I admit, and barely detectable even to my trained eyes, since it appears it ha to have been done, uh, been darned into the seams, and one which will render him almost irresistible to ladies. That represents a downward trend into black arts, which must surely cause you some motherly concern, Mrs. Pendragon. Interesting. She's really, really on the ball. I'm wondering if she can see through Sophie. Sophie thought uneasily about the gray and scarlet suit. She had darned the scenes without noticing it, had anything particular about it. Um, she had darned the scenes without it ha bleh. She had darned the scenes without noticing it had anything particular about it. But Mrs. Penstemon was an expert on magic, and Sophie was only an expert on clothes. Mrs. Penstemon put both gold mittens on top of her stick and canted her stiff body so that both her trained and piercing eyes stared into Sophie's. Sophie felt more and more nervous and uneasy. My life is nearly over, Mrs. Penstemon announced. I have felt death tiptoeing close for some time now. Oh, I'm sure that isn't so, Sophie said, trying to sound soothing. It was hard to sound like anything with Mrs. Pen um, it was hard to sound like anything with Mrs. Penstemon staring at her like that. I assure you it is so, said Mrs. Penstemon. This is why I was anxious to see you, Mrs. Pendragon. Howell, you see, was my last pupil. By the way, she's calling him Howell, too, as opposed to Howell. H-O-W-E-L-L again. Howell, you see, was my last pupil, and by far my best. I was about to retire when he came to me, uh, out of a foreign land. I thought my work was done when I trained Benjamin Sullivan, whom you probably know better as Wizard Suleiman, rest his soul. Oh, Benjamin Sullivan was Mrs. Miss Aragon's, or Miss Ar Argamon? I can't remember her name. That was her fiance and wizard suleiman is the one that's like dead or it sounds like dead from this we've heard him before 
Um, what is that? I trained Benjamin Sullivan, whom you probably know better as Wizard Suleiman, rest his soul, and procured him the post of royal magician. Oddly enough, he came from the same country as Howell. Then Howell came, and I saw at a glance that he had twice the imagination and twice the abilities, and though I admit he had some faults of character, I knew he was a force for good. Good, Mrs. Pendragon. But what is he now? What indeed, Sophie said. Something has happened to him, Mrs. Penstemon said, still staring piercingly at Sophie. And I am determined to put that right before I die. What do you think has happened? Sophie asked uncomfortably. I must rely on you to tell me that, said Mrs. Penstemon. My feeling is that he has gone the same way as the Witch of the Waste. They tell me she was not wicked once, though I have this only on hearsay, since she is older than either of us and keeps herself young by the arts. Howell has gifts in the same order as hers. It seems as uh, as if those of high of high ability cannot resist some extra dangerous stroke of cleverness, which results in a fatal flaw and begins to slow de uh, a slow decline to evil. Do you, by any chance, have a clue what it might be? Calcifer's voice came into Sophie's mind, saying, "The contract isn't doing either of us any good in the long run." She felt a little chilly in spite of the heat of the day, blowing through the open windows of the shaded, elegant room. Yes, she said. He's made some sort of contract with his fire demon. Mrs. Penstemon's hand shook a little on her stick. That will be it. You must break that contract, Mrs. Pendragon. Yeah. I, I think so, too. I think that she has, um, what's it called? Powers with clothes. Uh, and just, like, legitimate powers with clothes, and she just doesn't realize. I would if I knew how, Sophie said. Surely your maternal feelings uh, and your own strong magic gift will tell you how, Mrs. Penstemon said. I have been looking at you, Mrs. Pendragon, though you may not have noticed. Oh, I noticed, Mrs. Penstemon, Sophie said. And I like your gift, said Mrs. Penstemon. It brings life to things, such as that stick in your hand, which we have evidently talked to, to the extent that it has become what the layman would call a magic wand. I think you would not find it too hard to break the contract. Oh, so confirmed. Yes, but I need to know what the terms of it are, Sophie said. I think she just, like, did not hear that somehow. Did Hal tell you I was a witch? Because if he did, he did not. There is no need to be coy. You can rely on my experience to know these things, said Mrs. Penstemon. Then, to Sophie's relief, she shut her eyes. It was like a strong light being turned off. I do not know, nor do I wish to know about such contracts, she said. Her cane wobbled again, as if she might be shuddering. Her mouth quirked into a line, suggesting she had unexpectedly bitten on a peppercorn. But I now see, she said, what has happened to the witch. She made a contract with a fire demon, and over the years that demon has taken control of her. Demons do not understand good and evil, but they can be bribed into a contract provided the human, uh, the human offers them something valuable, something only humans have. This prolongs the life of both human and demon, and the human gets the demon's magic power to add to his, own, his or her own. Mrs. Penstemon opened her eyes again. That is all I can bear to say on the subject, she said, except to advise you to find out what the demon got. Now, I must bid you farewell. I have to rest a while. And like magic, which it probably was, the door opened and the page boy came in to usher Sophie out of the room. Sophie was extremely glad to go. She was all but squirming with embarrassment by then. She looked back at Mrs. Penstemon's rigid, upright form as the door closed and wondered if Mrs. Penstemon would have made her feel this bad if she really had been, uh, if she had really and truly been Hal's old mother. Sophie rather thought she would. I take my hat off to Hal for standing here, uh, for standing, uh, I take my hat off of Hal, nah, I take my hat off to Hal for standing her as a teacher for more than a day, she murmured to herself. Madam? asked the page boy, thinking Sophie was talking to him. I said, go slowly down the stairs or I can't keep up. Sophie told him. Her knees were wobbling. You young boys dash about so, she said. The page boy took her slowly and considerately down the shiny stairs. Halfway down, Sophie recovered enough from Mrs. Penstemon's personality to think of some of the things Mrs. Penstemon had actually said. She had said Sophie was a witch. Oddly enough, Sophie accepted this without any trouble at all. That explained the popularity of certain hats, she thought. It explained Jane Farrier's Count What's It. It probably, it possibly exp um, explained the jealousy of the Witch of the Waste. It was as if Sophie had always known this, but she had thought it was not proper to have a magic gift because she was the eldest of three. Letty had been far more sensible about such things. 
Then she thought of the gray and scarlet suit and nearly fell downstairs with dismay. She was the one who had put the charm on that. She could hear herself now mum murmuring it. Built to pull in all the girls, she had told it. Built to pull in the girls, she had told it. And of course it did. It had charmed Letty that day in the orchard. Yesterday, somewhat disguised, it must have had its secret effects on Miss Angorian, too. Oh, dear, Sophie thought. I've gone and doubled the number of hearts he'll have broken. I must get that suit off him somehow. Hal, in that same suit, was waiting in the cool black and white hall with Michael. Michael nudged Hal in a worried way as Sophie slowly came, uh, came slowly down the stairs behind the page boy. Hal looked saddened. You seem a bit ragged, he said. I think we'd better skip seeing the king. I'll go in black in my own name when I make your excuses. I can say my wicked ways have made you ill. That could be true, from the look of you. Sophie certainly did not wish to see the king. But she thought of what Calcifer had said. If the king commanded Hal to go into the waste, and the witch caught him, Sophie's own chance of being young again would have gone too. She shook her head. After Miss Pen uh, Mrs. Penstemon, she said, The king of Ingery will seem just like an ordinary person. And that's where we're supposed to end for today, but we can keep going if you would like. I think we're a little, sh like, I mean, I know we started late. We started at, like, six, so I think this would be ending early if I ended here. Maybe I just, like, sped bread. Um, it's up to you guys. I'm okay to keep reading. I find this very interesting, but at the same time, I don't want to keep anybody here. Um, okay. Maybe just, like, for another chapter or something. Um, okay, let me put this aside. <clears throat> okay, um, chapter 13 is in which Sophie blackens Howell's name. Sophie was feeling decidedly queer again when they reached the palace. It, its many golden domes dazzled her. The way to the front entrance was up a huge flight of steps, with a soldier in scarlet standing guard every six steps. The poor boys must have been near fainting in the heat, Sophie thought as she puffed her way dizzily up past them. At the top of the steps were archways, halls, corridors, lobbies, one after another. Sophie lost count of how many. At every archway a splendidly dressed person wearing white gloves, still somehow white in spite of the heat, inquired their business and then led them on to the next personage in the next archway. "'Mrs. Pendragon to see the king,' the voice of each echoed down the hall. About halfway, Hal was politely detached and told to wait. Michael and Sophie went on being handed from person to person. They were taken upstairs, after which the splendid persons were dressed in blue instead of red and handed on again until they came to an anteroom um, ante paneled in a hundred different colored woods. There, Michael was peeled off and made to wait, too. Sophie, who by this time was not at all sure whether she was not having some strange dream, was usher ushered through huge double doors, and this time the echoing voice said, "'Your Majesty, here is Mrs. Pendragon to see you.' And there was the king, not on a throne, but sitting in a rather square chair with only a little gold leaf on it, near the uh, middle of, the large of a large room, and dressed much more modestly than uh, the persons who waited on them. He was quite alone, like an ordinary person. True, he sat with one leg thrust out in a kingly sort of manner, but he was handsome in a plump, slightly vague way, but to Sophie he seemed quite youthful and just a touch too proud of, of being a king. She felt he ought, with that face, to have been more unsure of himself. Wow, what a burn. Um. Hmm, thank you guys. Um, he said... Well, what does Wizard Hal's mother want to see me about? And Sophie was suddenly overwhelmed by the fact that she was standing talking to the king. It was, she thought dizzily, as if the man sitting there in a he um, sitting there in the huge important thing which was kingship were two separate things that just happened to occupy the same chair. And she found she had forgotten every word of the careful, delicate things Hal had told her to say, but she had to say something. He sent me to tell you he's not going to look for your brother, she said. Your Majesty. She stared at the king. The king stared back. It was a disaster. Are you sure? asked the king. The wizard seemed quite willing when I talked to him. 
The one thing Sophie had left in her head was that she was here to blacken Hal's name. So she said, he lied about that. He didn't want to annoy you. He's a slither-outer, if, you know, if you know what I mean. A slither-outer, if you know what I mean, your majesty. And he hopes to slither out of finding my brother Justin, said the king. I see. Won't you sit down, since I see you are not young, and tell me, what the, uh, tell me the wizard's reasons? There was another plain chair rather a long way from the king. Sophie creaked herself down into it and sat with her hands propped on her stick like Mrs. Penstemon, hoping that would make her feel better. But her mind was still simply a roaring white blank of stage fright. All she could think of to say was, only a coward would send his old mother along to plead for him. You can see what he's like just from that, your majesty. Your majesty. It is an unusual step, the king said gravely. But I told him that I'd make it worth his while if he agreed. Oh, he doesn't care about money, Sophie said. But he's scared stiff of the Witch of the Waste, you see. She put a curse on him, and it's just caught up with him. Then he has every right, a reason to be scared, the king said with a slight shiver. But tell me more, please, about the wizard. More about how? Sophie thought desperately. I have to blacken his name. Her mind was such a blank that for a second it actually seemed to her that Hal had no faults at all. How stupid! Well, he's fickle, careless, selfish, and hysterical, she said. Half the time I think he doesn't care about what happens to anyone as long as he's alright. But then I find out how awfully kind he's been to someone. Then I think he's, uh, he's kind, just when it suits him. Only then I find out he undergoes, uh, he undercharges poor people. I don't know, your majesty. He's a mess. <laughs> That's fair. My impression, said the king, was that Hal is an unprincipled, unslippery rogue with a glib tongue and a clever mind. Would you agree? How well you put it, Sophie said heartily. But you left out how vain he is, and... She looked suspiciously at the king across the yards of carpet. He seemed so surprisingly ready to help her black in Hal's name. The king was smiling. It was the slight, uncertain smile that went with the person he was, rather than the king he ought to be. Thank you, Mrs. Pendragon, he said. Your outspokenness has taken a weight off my mind. The wizard agreed to look at my brother so readily that I thought I had picked the wrong man after all. I feared he was someone who was either unable to resist showing off or would do anything for money. But you have shown me that he is just the man I need. Oh, confound it, Sophie cried out. He sent me to tell you he wasn't. And so you did, the king hitched his chair and inch toward Sophie. Let me be equally outspoken now, he said. Mrs. Pendragon, I need my brother back badly. It is not just that I am fond of him and regret the quarrel we had. It is not even that certain people are whispering that I did away with him myself, which anyone who knows us, would, uh, knows us both knows to be perfect nonsense. No, Mrs. Pendragon. The fact is, my brother Justin is a brilliant general, and with High Norland and Strangia about to declare war on us, I can't do without him. The witch has threatened me too, you know. Now, now that all reports agree that Justin did indeed go into the waste, I am certain that the witch meant to be uh, to be without him when I needed him. Meant me to be without him when I needed him the most. I think she took Wizard Suleiman as bait to fetch Justin, and it follows that I need a fairly clever and unscrupulous wizard to get him back. How will just run away? Sophie warned the king. No, said the king. I don't think he will. The fact that he sent you tells me that. He did it to show me that he was too much of a coward to care what I thought of him, isn't that right, Mrs. Pendragon? Sophie nodded. She wished she could have remembered all Howe's delicate remarks. The king would have understood them, even if she did not. Not the act of a vain man, said so, uh, said, uh, the king said. But no one would do that except as a last resort, which shows me that Wizard Howe will do what I want if I make it clear to him that his last resort has failed. I think you may be... Er, taking t delicate hints there, aren't you, your majesty? Oh, sorry. I think you may be taking delicate hints that aren't there, your majesty, Sophie said. I think not, the king smiled. His slightly vague features had all firmed up. He was sure he was right. Tell Wizard Hal, Mrs. Pendragon, that I am appointing him royal wizard, as from now on, as from now, um, Tell, sorry, tell Wizard Hal, Mrs. Pendragon, that I am appointing him royal wizard as from now, with our royal command to find Prince Justin, alive or dead, before the year is out. You have our leave to go now. He held out his hand to Sophie, just like Mrs. Penstemon, but a little less royally. Sophie levered herself up, wondering if she was meant to kiss this hand or not. But since she felt more like raising her stick and beating the king over the head with it, she shook the king's hand and gave, it, uh, gave a creaking little curtsy. It seemed to be the right thing to do. The king gave her a friendly smile as she hobbled away to the double doors. Oh, curses, she muttered to herself. It was not only exactly what Hal did not want. 
Hal would, uh, Hal would not move the castle a thousand miles away. Letty, Martha, and Michael would all be miserable, and no doubt there would be torrents of green slime into the bargain as well. It comes up being the eldest, she muttered, eld uh, she muttered while she was shoving the heavy doors open. You just can't win! And here was another thing which had gone wrong. In her annoyance and disappointment, Sophie had come somehow come out through the wrong set of double doors. The anteroom had mirrors all around it. In them, she could see her own little bent, hobbling shape in its fine gray, gla uh, gray dress. A great many people in blue, uh, in blue court dress, others in suits as fine as Hal's, but no Michael. Michael, of course, was hanging about in the anteroom, paneled in a hundred kinds of wood. Oh, drat! said Sophie. One of the couriers hastened up to her and bowed. Madam Sorceress, can I be of assistance? He was an undersized young man, rather red-eyed. Sophie stared at him. Oh, good gracious, she said. So the spell worked. Oh. <laughs> Red-eyed. He he hit uh, himself with cayenne pepper. It's the dueling guy. It did indeed, said the small courier a little ruefully. Oh, sorry. It did indeed, said the small courier a little uh, ruefully. I disarmed him while he was sneezing, and he is now suing me. But the important thing, his face spread into a happy smile, is that my dear Jane has come back to me. Oh, he's the Count! This is Jane Farrier's person. I actually like how this book reveals things. It's like, it just does it so casually. <laughs> like, you really have to be paying attention. My dear Jane came back to me. No, what can I do for you? I feel responsible for your happiness. I'm not sure that it might be the other way around, Sophie said. Are you by any chance the Count of Cataract? At your service, said the small courier, uh, courtier, bowing. Jane Farrier must be a good foot taller than he is, Sophie thought. It is all definitely my fault. Yes, you can help me, she said and explained about Michael. The Count of Cataract assured her that Michael would be fetched and brought down to the entrance hall to meet her. It was no trouble at all. Ah, he took Sophie to a gloved attendant himself and handed her over with much bowing and smiling. Sophie was handed to another attendant, then another, just as before, and eventually hobbled her way down the stairs guarded by soldiers. In the beginning of the book, there was somebody who came and bought a hat from Sophie and then ended up finding the love of a... Like, she was kind of, like, plain-looking and no one thought that she'd really go anywhere and then she ended up finding the love of, like, um, a count. And it was count the Count of Cataract. And and she actually mentioned her previously uh, in the previous chapter. I can't remember what they said about Jane Farrier, but they mentioned Jane Farrier and uh, her finding love with her count. And, uh, yeah, now we see the count that she fell in love with. Yeah. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Mm hmm. Exactly. Uh, do, 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 do. He took Sophie to a gloved attendant himself and handed her over with much bowing and smiling. Sophie was handed to another attendant, then another, just as before, and eventually hobbled her way down the stairs guarded by the soldiers. Michael was not there. Nor was Hal, but that was small relief to Sophie. She thought she might have guessed it would be like this. The Count of Cataract was obviously a person who never got a thing right, and she was another herself. It was probably lucky she had even found the way out. By now, she was so tired and hot and dejected that she decided not to wait for Michael. She wanted to sit down in the fireside chair and tell Calcifer the mess she had been, uh, she had made of things. She hobbled down the grand staircase. She hobbled down a grand avenue. She stumped along another, where spires and towers and gilded roofs circled around in giddy profusion. And she realized it was worse than she had thought. She was lost. She had absolutely no idea how to find this, the disguised stable where the castle entrance was. She turned up another handsome th um, thoroughfare at, a, at random, but she did not recognize that either. By now, she did not even know the way back to the palace. She tried asking people she met. Most of them seemed as hot and tired as she was. Was it Pendragon, they said? Who is he? Sophie hobbled on hopelessly. Well, why don't you find the, the palace? Like, ask about where the palace is of the king. They should know that. And then talk to the workers there, and they should know where to find Wizard Pendragon, I would imagine. Um, Sophie hobbled on hopelessly. She was near giving up, and sitting on the next doorstep for the night. 
when she passed at the uh, when she passed the end of a narrow street where Mrs. Penstemon's house was. Ah, she thought, I can go and ask the footman. He and Hal were so friendly that he must know where Hal lives. So she turned down the street. The Witch of the Waste was coming up to, uh, up it toward her. How Sophie recognized the witch would be hard to say. Her face was different. Her hair, instead of being overly chestnut curls, was a rippling mass of, mass of red hanging almost to her waist, and she was dressed in fluttering, floating, bleh, floating flutters of auburn and pale yellow. Very cool and lovely, she looked. Sophie knew her at once. She almost stopped, but not quite. There's no reason she should remember me, Sophie thought. I must be just one of hundreds of people she's enchanted. And Sophie stumbled bo stumped boldly on, thumping her stick on the cobbles and reminding herself, in case of trouble, that Mrs. Penstemon had said that same stick had become a powerful object. That was another mistake. The witch came floating up the little street, smiling, twirling her parasol, followed by two sulky-looking page boys in orange velvet. When she came level with Sophie, she stopped, and tawny perfume filled Sophie's nose. "'Why, it's Mrs. Hatter!' the witch said, laughing. "'I never forget a face, particularly if I've made it myself. "'What are you doing here, dressed up all so fine?' "'If you're thinking of calling on that Mrs. Penstemon, you can save yourself the trouble. "'The old biddy's dead!' "'Dead!' said Sophie." She had a silly impulse to add, but she was alive an hour ago, and she stopped herself because death is like that. People are alive until they die. Yes, dead, said the witch. She refused to tell me where someone w uh, where someone was. We want, um, that I, okay, sorry. She refused to tell me where someone was that I want to find. She said, over my dead body, so I took her at her word. She's looking for Hal, Sophie thought. Now what do I do? If she had not been so very hot and tired, Sophie would have been almost too scared to think. For a witch who could kill Mrs. Penstemon, uh, sorry, for a witch who could kill Mrs. Penstemon would have no trouble with Sophie, stick or no stick. And if she suspected for a moment that Sophie knew where Hal was, that could be the end of Sophie. Perhaps it was just as well Sophie could not remember where the castle entrance was. I don't know who this person uh, who this person is that you've killed," she said. "But that makes you a wicked murderess." But the witch did not seem to. Uh, but the witch did seem to suspect anyway. She said, "But I thought you said you were going to call on Mrs. Pensimmon." "No," said Sophie. "It was you that said that. I don't have to know her to call. Uh, I. Uh, I don't know. I don't have to know her to call you wicked for killing her." "Then where were you going?" said the witch. Sophie was tempted to tell the witch to mind her own business, but that was asking for trouble. So she said the only thing, the other thing that she could think of. I'm going to see the king, she said. The witch laughed disbelievingly. But will the king see you? Yes, of course, Sophie declared, trembling with terror and anger. I made an appointment. I'm going to petition him for, his, for better conditions for hatters. I keep going, you see, even after what you did to me. Then you're going in the wrong direction, said the witch. The palace is behind you. Oh? "'Is it?' said Sophie. She did not have to pretend to be surprised. "'Then I must have got turned around. I have been a little vague about directions ever since you made me like this.' The witch laughed heartily and did not believe a word of it. "'Then come with me,' she said, "'and I'll show you the way to the palace.' There seemed nothing Sophie could do but turn round and stump beside the witch, with the two page boys trudging silently, sullenly behind her, uh, behind them both. Anger and hopelessness settled over Sophie. She looked at the witch floating gracefully beside her and remembered Mrs. Penstemon had said that the witch was an old woman, really. It's not fair, Sophie thought, but there was nothing you could do about it. Why did you make me like this, she demanded, as they went up a grand th uh, thoroughfare with a fountain at the top of it. You were preventing me from getting some information I needed, so, uh, the witch said. I got it in the end, of course. Sophie was quite mystified by this. She was wondering whether it would do any good to say that there had been uh, had there must be some mistake when the witch added though I dare say you had no idea you were and laughed as if it was the funniest part have you heard of a land called Wales she asked ah um, no said sophie is it under the sea the witch found this funnier than ever not at the moment she said it's where wizard hal comes from you know what oh wow that's why the, the language sounded so weird. It was Welsh. You know Wizard Hal, don't you? Only by hearsay, Sophie lied. He eats girls. He's as wicked as you. But she felt rather cold. It did not seem to be due to the fountain they were passing at that moment. Beyond the fountain, across the pink marble plaza, were the stone stairs with the palace at the top. There you are. There's the palace, said the witch. 
Are you sure you can manage all those stairs? None the better for you, said Sophie. Make me young make me young again, and I'll run up them, even in this heat. That wouldn't be half so funny, said the witch. Up you go. And if you do persuade the king to see you, remind him that his grandfather sent me to the waste, and I bear him a grudge for that. Sophie looked hopelessly up the long flight of stairs. At least there was nobody but soldiers on them. With the luck she was having today, it would not have surprised her to find Michael and Hal on their way down. Since the witch was obviously going to stand there and make sure she went up, Sophie had no choice but to climb them. Up she hobbled, past the sweating soldiers, all the way to the palace entrance again, hating the witch more with every step. She turned round, panting at the top. The witch was still there, a floating russet shape at the foot, uh, a floating russet shape at the foot, with two small orange figures beside her, waiting to see her thrown out of the palace. Drat her, said Sophie. She hobbled over to the guards at the archway. Her bad luck still held. There was no sign of Michael or Hal in the reaches beyond. She was forced to say to the guards, there was something I forgot to tell the king. They remembered her. They let her go inside, so to be received by a personage in white gloves. And before Sophie had collected her wits, the palace machinery... Hold on, sorry, my, no, my ears had kind of, like, popped. Um, blah, 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 blah. I know. Gosh, I feel so bad for her. And it's okay, there are a lot of characters here, and like I said, this book is, like, really subtle with, with its reveals. So if you don't, like, recall all of that, then it could be hard to, like, feel the reveals. Um, okay. Um, da, 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 da. And before Sophie had collected her wits, the palace machinery was in motion again, and she was being handed from person to person, just like the first time, until she arrived at the same double doors, and the same person in blue was announcing, Mrs. Pendragon to see you again, your majesty. It was like a bad dream, Sophie thought as she went into the same large room. She seemed to have no choice but to blacken Hal's name again. The trouble was, what with all that had happened, and stage fright again into the bargain, her mind was blanker than ever. The king, this time, was standing at a large desk in one corner, rather anxiously moving flags about a map. He looked up and said pleasantly, They tell me there was something you forgot to say. Yes, said Sophie. Hal says he'll only look for Prince Justin if you promise him your daughter's hand in marriage. What put that into my head, she thought. He'll have us both executed. The king gave her a concerned look. Mrs. Pendragon, you must know that's quite out of the question, he said. I can see you must be very worried about your son to suggest it, but you can't keep him tied to your apron strings forever, you know, and my mind is made up. Please come and sit in this chair. You seem tired. Sophie tottered to the low chair the king pointed to and sank into it, wondering when the guards would arrive to arrest her. The king looked vaguely round. My daughter was here just now, he said. To Sophie's considerable surprise, he bent down and looked under the desk. Valeria, he called. Valley, come on out. This way, there's a good girl. There was a shuffling noise. After a second, Princess Valeria shunted herself out from under the desk in sitting position, grinning benignly. She had four teeth, but she was not old enough to have grown a proper head of hair. All she had was a ring of wispy whiteness around her ears, above her ears. When she saw Sophie, she grinned wider yet, and reached out with the hand she had just been sucking, and took hold of Sophie's dress. Sophie's dress responded with a spreading weight, a wet stain as the princess hauled herself to her feet on it. Staring up into Sophie's face, Valeria addressed a friendly remark to her in what was clearly a private foreign language. "'Oh,' said Sophie, feeling a fool, an awful fool. "'I understand how a parent feels, Mrs. Pendragon,' said the king. And... All right, there we go, then. So, let's talk. <laughs> I know kids are gross. That's my feeling, too. Like, kind of cute. Like, that was kind of cute, but also... Bleh. Oh, I see we... I didn't even pay attention to the whole, um... Uh... da 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 da, da. Um, skipped frames thing, and I see it's not been doing fantastic. It's not terrible, but it's not been doing fantastic. Um, what do you mean it feels like a dream to you? Let me know.
I mean, I imagine that's on purpose. Um, it feels kind of magical and whimsical that way. For, to me, at least. Um, and it, it doesn't handhold, you know? Um, I appreciate that it does confirm answers and plot points brought up previously. However, um, um, what's it called? It, it certainly doesn't, like, bring it back up again. Like, you just kind of have to be paying attention, like, really close attention. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. I imagine it's probably difficult to not be having a copy of it, though. I feel like this is one of the ones that really benefits, um, like, reading along. Or that you can really benefit, rather, from reading along with. You're not... You're not stupid. This book is just... Very snappy. Um... So yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I wish that the movie were more like the book. There's so much that is just not in the movie or is different. Like I said, there's a lot of visual stuff that is. Um, so if you ever want, like, a visual reference of something, like, it's okay for that. But there's a lot of stuff that's different. There's a lot of stuff that's missing. Um, and I'm kind of sad now that we got the movie version that we did instead of, like, something like this. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate that for sure. It's just that I do think that actually reading along and listening would probably be best for a book like this. Personally, I don't know that I could keep track, um, if I wasn't, um, what's it called? Uh, if I didn't have the book in front of me. Yeah, it's a bum. It's kind of upsetting. Uh, well, the, like, again, the visuals are so nice, though. It's a Miyazaki film. Um, so the artwork, the scenery, the settings, it's all really nice and pretty. But, um, it's just an absolute, like, a really shame that a lot of the storyline and the plot points are missing out. Um, it's interesting, because I feel like Miyazaki films are like, <clears throat> I feel like the main draw of Miyazaki films tends to be the scenery, the setting, um, just the visuals. He's an artist, first and foremost, I think, Miyazaki, so I think that kind of makes sense. But the stories, generally, from what I've seen, even in their, like, like fantastic I hate that word, so I did not want to use it, but it just came out. Um, even in their, I'll say, grandness of setting and the whole fantasy element of them often has, like, a very slice-of-life feel. Like, for instance, uh, Kiki's Delivery Service is about a witch coming of age, but it all feels very mellow the whole time. It's pleasant to watch. I really like it, and, it, like, it's very calming. Um, but it's all very, like, a day in the life, sort of, in this fantastic place. Um, and, like, even, like, Spirited Away is somewhat like that. I think Spirited Away is a little more, um... I keep wanting, like, I keep nearly saying fantastical, and I don't like that word. But it is in my head, for whatever reason. Yeah, that's Spirited Away. Mm-hmm. I really like Spirited Away, too. My book looks like this. Hold on. Yeah. No, this way. Yeah. If you look up Howl's Moving Castle, um, Diane Wynne-Jones... You should be able to find it on Amazon. There are a couple of other versions. 
It might be the same, but just like a different cover. I think you should be. I mean, yeah, I can see. If I can find it. Super that I have in terms of like a link and try to pass it along at some point. Um, magical whimsical, I think, is a better word for it. Not just magical. Um, mystifying. I feel like just whimsical is like the most fitting one. That's not fantastical. Um, but yeah, like, even this one, like, again, the settings are beautiful, the, and grand, and everything, and, like, there's a lot of whimsy in it, but it still, like, feels pretty mellow and chill, mostly. There's stuff, but again, there's stuff, like, that's missing from this that I, I really wish was in the movie. Hmm. <clears throat> Um, but okay, I guess that that would be it for now, unless do you guys have anything else that you'd like to discuss? I'm happy to stay and talk if you want to. I feel bad for Mrs. Penstemon. Like, she knew she was going to die soon, but I wonder if she knew that the Witch of the Waste was going to kill her. It sounds like maybe she did. And, um, I know that Sophie was really intimidated by Mrs. Pinstemon, but I kind of liked her. Yeah. I can't believe that the Witch of the Waste just, like, casually killed her. I was very, um, surprised also to see the stuff from, um, Cardiff? I guess that's where we were? Because that was not in the book at- I mean, that was not in the movie at all. At all. That was not what was through the door. Yeah, that also, like, wasn't really in the book. Which is also- it's kind of weird. Like, that feels like a big plot point. I mean, not in the book. In the movie. That wasn't there at all. Really strange. Really strange thing to cut out. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I guess, you know, we've been suspecting it. I thought maybe it was gonna be something that just kinda, like, was understood but not said. And then it was like, okay, well, then I guess it makes sense that it wasn't brought up in the movie because they don't actually say this. It's just kinda, like, maybe hinted at. But no, they outright say it. <laughs> I'm interested to find out about Calcifer, too. Um, I have a feeling that Calcifer is a falling star. And that uh, Hal was kind of, like, caught in a deal with him. So that, that means that all falling, star, star, all falling stars are demons? I don't know. Possibly, if this is proved correct. Interesting. Kind of gives you a different view of falling stars. <laughs> stupid dropped and skipped frames. Is it very laggy? How are we doing? Mm-hmm. Well, the thing about them, they're saying that demons are not, like, good or evil. They don't understand good and evil. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's learned, like... From years of being with Hal, because apparently he's been here for a very long time. Mm. No, but, like, genuinely, I'm curious about it. Ugh, I'm sorry. I wish it weren't laggy. 
I don't know what to do besides continually change my camera size. I hope you guys have been drinking your water. I, I haven't had any, but, or haven't really had any, but. Oh, good, I'm glad. Yeah, I, I do think they're, they're not doing anything with any specific intention, just trying to live, probably. I mean, I guess technically water counts. There is water in coffee, however, I mean, wait, strike that. I guess technically coffee counts. There is water in coffee, but not really. If we're talking seriously, you should drink actual water. Don't just drink coffee. Coffee will dehydrate you, which is the exact opposite of water. what water will do. So you need to drink water as well. Good. All right, guys. So I think that's where we'll be ending off for today. Um, I'm really excited about this book. I'm glad of how we're going with it. We have a bit left probably like two more times i'd say um i meant <laughs> what is that emoji oh it's like a shoosh um what's it called uh next week i'll still be here next week uh the week after that i'll probably be away and we'll see if we do a stream if we do camera um i'll keep you guys posted we'll see what happens but, uh, for now, I hope you've enjoyed. Um, next week, we'll be back with, on Saturday at 5pm, we're actually going to be starting Pokemon Ultra Moon to do a Nuzlocke for that. Uh, so that's going to be fun. My very first Nuzlocke, and I, I don't know how it's going to go at all. Uh, I'm just working on getting the emulator working straight. Um, hopefully it will go okay there are some things to work out with it but hopefully i'm on the right track with this um and then on sunday we'll be back at five o'clock with more Howl's moving castle so thank you for watching please go ahead and find me on youtube with the exact same username is here uh, you can go ahead and check out my videos i have replays of old episodes of hot of a boyfriend and soon to be hot of a boyfriend holiday star as well and we have the replays of our Quote the Author episode, so go ahead and like, comment on those to just, you know, let me know your support, and if you want to, like, talk about questions or talk about anything like that, anything that you might not understand or have thought about in the time between it's taken for those episodes to be uploaded, please go ahead and do that. It really helps out a lot. Um, and subscribe. Uh, for now, though, oh, okay, before I sign off, I'll let you know, a Nuzlocke is basically, like, you catch the first Pokemon you see in every route. Um, you have to name them. If they faint, they die. That's it. You have to get, like, rid of them. Um, so the idea is that you have to go through the whole game like that. So we'll try and we'll see how we do with that. Um, not everybody makes it through. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, thank you again for watching. I hope you had a great time. And I will see you next week. This has been Sky. Bye-bye.